Welcome to Lawton Online with your host, Andrew Lawton. He's locked, loaded, and ready to fire. Lawton Online starts right now. Hello and welcome, everyone. This is Lawton Online here on the Rebel.media. My name is Andrew Lawton, your host for the next however long this takes, because after all, it's a podcast and I don't need to stick to a schedule. So that's the one thing that's the greatest about being here uh, as opposed to traditional radio, which, by the way, I love. And I also love when I do television, but I don't like that. Oh, okay, you know, six minutes later, got to take a break. Oh, you know, okay, seven minutes later, got to take a break. In any case. Great to have you joining me this afternoon or this evening, whenever it is that you are listening to this show on the Rebel.media. We've got lots of great stuff to get to today. I'm going to be joined by the man who has the distinct honor of being my most frequent guest on Lot and Online. This is a, an honor indeed, I think. The most frequent guest on Lot and Online is actually best-selling author and radio and television host Mark Stein. Now, Mark Stein is going to be joining me later on in the back half of the program to talk about his new project. Now, this is not a new book, although I hope he has another one of those out soon because everything he writes is, is, I mean, like the literary equivalent of gold. But no, his new album. Believe it or not, Mark Stein, also a recording artist, has an album of cat songs. So we'll have a couple of the songs from that album to play for you later on in the show. And we'll chat with Mark a little bit about what happened behind the scenes and also what's going on in Paris at the United Nations Climate Summit. So lots of very timely topics there. Also going to be talking very shortly about uh, Chef Jamie Oliver, celebrity chef Jamie Oliver, and the fat tax that he wants to bring to Canada alongside his restaurant that he's opening up in Toronto. So we'll be talking about that later on as well. But I have to spend the first little segment of this show here, actually, like I mentioned before, with timing and all that, might not actually be little, talking about the question of censorship and whether or not it's ever appropriate. Now, when I talk about censorship in this context, I'm not talking about things like libel and slander and distribution of child pornography and all of those other things. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm dealing with censorship of ideas because of the ideas themselves. It might not seem like a topic we need to address, but it is something that is timely, especially in Germany. Now, believe it or not, we actually have a couple of listeners to the show in Germany, (laughs) at least two that have reached out to me in the past. So thank you very much for tuning in. This one is right up uh, both of your alleys here. Because for the first time, Mein Kampf, the book that was the struggle, my struggle is how it translates, of Adolf Hitler that he penned in the early to mid-20s, has become or will become on December 31st, 2015, public domain. Currently, the copyright of the book is owned by the state of Bavaria, and they have not officially released or even unofficially, they've not allowed it to be published in German since 1945 when the Allies banned the dubious work, as it's known, and gave the rights to the state of Bavaria. So since then, the German language version, the original version of Mein Kampf, has not been published. Now, the copyright expires on the 70th anniversary, or the 70th year, rather, of the author's death. Adolf Hitler died in 1945, 70 years, December 31st, 2015. That book becomes open source, public domain, whatever word you want to use, it's fair game. Now, for a lot of people, I think this may trigger this fear of, oh my goodness, are neo-Nazis going to rise up now? And I highly doubt it. But the silver lining of this is that a group of academics in Germany from the Institute for Contemporary History in Munich are excited, and they're actually looking forward to publishing their 2,000-page edition in two volumes, which has been three years in the making and has 3,500 academic notations. They're going to publish it, which is intended to show the work in a historical context 
to critique Adolf Hitler, to critique Adolf Hitler's writing, to expose his lies, to expose his aggrandizations, and to basically showcase the book for what it was, which was a vanity piece by a narcissist, by an evil one at that. And they're not doing it to celebrate Nazism. They're doing it specifically to criticize. Now, the lead of the team working on this project said on uh, Tuesday of this week, quote, this is really one of the best relics we have of the Third Reich. And he's talking about it as a comparison he gave to Hitler's lair in the Alps. I think Ober Salzburg is what it's called, which is a tourism destination now. Two million people a year see it. And he thinks that Mein Kampf is also for intellectual tourists or for history tourists, something that there is going to be interest in. Now, the fear, though, that people have and people are raising is that this is going to make more people align with Nazi ideas and Nazi values. And believe it or not, Israel, a country from which I just returned, does not want the publication of this book at all. And even if the first publication of it, the first group that wants to take advantage of it being in the public domain is doing it for academic reasons, there's no guarantee that the next person to want to print off a copy in Germany is going to have a similar academic mandate when they publish the book. And this is because you can't judge people based on what's on their minds if you are the state. I mean, as individuals, we can absolutely judge people based on their thought processes, but not as the state. We ultimately get to decide as individuals if we believe this is a book that's worth publication, if we believe there's merit to people understanding it, to people knowing it, to people studying it. But that's it. That's it. I mean, the government should be there to basically get out of the way, tax the companies, give them services for those taxes, and even do that in a very limited way. And that's about it. But that's not the mandate the government exists by today. We talk about the fear of thought, the fear of feelings, the fear of what might happen if we give people free reign over ideas. Free reign over the ideas that may come if you read something that goes against the status quo. Read something that goes against what is considered socially acceptable. And and what's shocking about this is that we don't have to look that far to find a regime where book burning of any book that did go against the status quo was accepted. And that is, ironically enough, the Nazi regime historically under Adolf Hitler. And I'm not saying that trying to eliminate or eradicate Mein Kampf because we don't want a flare-up of Nazism, is the same as burning the Bibles in the streets or whatever, because they're not the same. Different, different motivations, different texts. But the principle is the same, which is that it is state-mandated censorship because of a fear of what will happen if people are exposed to different ideas. And this is, I might add, to say nothing of the actual logistical problems here which is that in a global economy, in a global marketplace with access to the internet, banning the book in one country does not ban it from anywhere else in the world. Germans can still find a copy on Amazon, get it shipped to their front door. Germans can find a copy on the internet and read it anywhere, as can Canadians. And in Canada, there's no legal ban on Mein Kampf. You can go out, walk to your neighbor's house and give them a copy for Christmas if you'd like. You can go to a bookstore and legally buy, read, and own Mein Kampf without any issue. Have we seen a revival in white supremacy and neo-Nazism and Aryanism and anti-Semitism as a result of this? No, I don't think in, people in Canada would have, even, would have even given it two thoughts. I think to even say that Canadians would have given it one thought is perhaps a little bit generous. And here's a, a great example, by the way, in Canada of how the free market works. So Heather Reisman, CEO of Indigo Books, or chief book lover, as she's known, and I've met Heather on a, on a couple of occasions, and she has a policy where she will not allow Mein Kampf to be sold in Indigo bookstores or in Chapters bookstores. 
Maybe a couple of people are upset. I know there have actually been issues in the past where people have criticized Indigo for censoring. And if a private company says we don't want to carry this book, to me, that's not a problem of censorship at all. That's simply a challenge of the free market doing what the free market does. If there's a demand for it, more stores will offer it. There isn't a demand, so if you want to get it, you can go online, and that's about it. But Chapters Indigo, not going to sell it to you. And I think that we need to have a level of faith in humanity here, which I realize may be a lot to ask. But a level of faith in humanity that the world is not going to implode because we've allowed people the opportunity to make choices. Anti-Semitism is wrong. White supremacy is wrong. Nazism is wrong. Everyone who is sensible knows this. The people who don't are not going to be swayed by one book because of the text of the book. They're going to be swayed because they are weak-willed. The same people that can pick up a Koran and find themselves inspired to commit violence, it's because that gene already existed in them. They were already prone to that form of radicalization. It's not something that we can blame on the book, blame on the text. And not to throw Christians under the bus here, but you're going to find a lot more complicated themes in the Bible and a lot more brutality in the Bible and in the Koran and in the Torah than you're going to in Mein Kampf anyway. I think people, when they hear Mein Kampf and think Hitler wrote it, they immediately think of him scribbling diary entries in the middle of the night as he's exterminating Jews. Well, no, the book, and I haven't read the whole book, by the way, but I've read reviews of it and I've read excerpts from it, is actually quite banal. It was written a decade and a half before the Holocaust and seems to be more filled with delusions than gore. So that, I think, needs to be somewhat of a guiding philosophy here, which which is that in so many of these cases, things become examples of the cart getting before the horse. The outrage of Mein Kampf being available for sale in Germany to a lot of people will be waning once people realize that there's really nothing in it that's going to dramatically alter, nor even minimally alter, the cultural fabric in Germany. Now, I realize that I'm looking at this through a Western, small-L liberal lens. I do. And I realize that in Germany, when you have people who are alive, who were quite literally around when this is happening, who were involved when this was happening, you're dealing with a very different collective understanding of things. I understand that very much. So, too, do I understand that in Israel, things are a lot different. The connection to the Holocaust and to Hitler and to the Nazis is very different than it is for me taking a libertarian perspective here. Whereas the libertarian streak in me just says, you know what, do what you want, read what you want, buy what you want, sell what you want, just don't hurt anyone else in the process. And I don't necessarily think that there's anything wrong with that in this day and age, even though Europeans are still having to get over it. And I don't mean that as a pejorative. They're needing to get over this because this is still so fresh and so close for them. So as much as I am a supporter of Israel, and I think Israel is important to memorialize the Holocaust the way it does and its own national history or its people's history. I don't think that advocating for the ban of a book is something that helps them in that broad cause. Even if the group that was doing this was not a group of historians, but was a group of neo-Nazis, I would still say go for it. First off, you can't actually eradicate a book that exists online and exists in a lot of shelves and exists in translations around the world and at one point in Germany's history was the most popular book ever sold. So you can't do it logistically. But even if you could, that doesn't mean you should. And I'm sorry for dripping into like a Dr. Seuss moment there with a rhyme. But this is a hodgepodge, it's reported. This book of his personal memory his lamentations of failure, his beliefs about nationalism. It's a manifesto. It's not a diary, but it's also part diary. And it just doesn't seem to have the impact that people would like. When you censor something, you turn it or its author into a martyr. And when that happens, when that is done, all you do is offer more credibility 
to these people. More credibility to these ideas. That's what martyrdom is. That's what martyrdom does. We've got to take a quick break here. When we come back, more Lawton Online on the Rebel.media in just a couple of moments. Stay tuned, people. We'll be right back. Intelligent and indefatigable. You're tuned into Lawton Online with Andrew Lawton. Welcome back to Lawton Online here on the Rebel.media. So, if you did not know this about me, I have to make a confession. And it's not even, well, okay, you know, it's a confession. I was once on a reality show. I know. And that's not something that makes anyone look too too good but i was a uh, contestant for one episode i did not last long in the reality show on the first season of master chef canada now this is because i love cooking i have an interest in the culinary arts i have an interest in different types of cooking different style of cuisine i obviously as my picture would uh, share with you have an interest in eating as well but not just eating copious amounts of things copious amounts of good quality things see yeah always looking for the good stuff in any case I like Jamie Oliver, chef uh, Jamie Oliver, a British uh, celebrity chef known for a whole a bunch of television shows, known for restaurants, known for product lines. He has uh, whored himself out to, I think, Sobeys in Canada, and you can buy his knives, his salt, his spices, his pepper, his this, his that. And, and look, good for him. He is a stellar capitalist, as is Gordon Ramsay with a slightly better temperament. And he's opening a restaurant up in Toronto. Now, that's great. Investment, job creators, good food, all that sort of stuff. Except in the course of drumming up publicity for this new restaurant, he did an interview on CBC's Q. And he started to talk about public policy. Now, anytime a celebrity chef starts talking about public policy, I would get a little bit perhaps leery of it, even more so when it's not even a Canadian chef that's pontificating. But he said in the interview with Shad, this is the show formerly hosted by Gian Gomeshi, and, well, we know what happened there. He said that he thinks Canada should embrace a national tax on sugary beverages, better known as a fat tax. Now, I didn't actually catch the interview, but I learned of it after the fact by talking to Kevin Lacey from the uh, CTF, the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. He's the organization's Atlantic director, and he has a blog post about this up at the Huffington Post. Uh, Kevin, great to talk to you. Thanks for your time today. Oh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. This is an important topic. Now, I know the CTF doesn't usually cover the restaurant opening beat, so you've gotten to, to spread your wings a little bit here as a commentator. Well, that's right. And uh, one of the things that tweaked this for me was uh, Mr. Oliver, Chef Oliver had come to Nova Scotia. And when he was in Nova Scotia down in Pictou Lodge, which would be in the northwestern part of the province, beautiful little spot, uh, it's the headquarters of Sobeys, the, uh, the uh, grocery store chain. And when he was there, he hosted a dinner, and, and he had things like uh, lobster tail with butter and maple <laughs> fudge and a whole bunch of treats and goodies and things that he was serving um, to his customers. And uh, a lot of them are high in fat, high in sugar, and frankly, not very good for you. So it was a bit of a surprise to me when a few days later I flipped on the radio and there he was talking about why Canada needs a tax on sugary beverages. Uh, it seems to me there's a bit of hypocrisy here where Mr. Oliver will say on one hand that we all need to pay a little bit more for these products, but on the other hand, we'll actually serve them and create them in his restaurants and in his menus. And Andrew, the reason why uh, these ta this tax, uh, we have such an issue with the tax is because it doesn't achieve the objectives that he says it does. It does not make people thinner. If you look at uh, people will consume uh, pop or beverages, whether the price uh, is marginally higher or not, he charges a 10 cent premium on all pop in his restaurants, that is unlikely to change people's behavior. If you look at over the last decade, pop consumption is on the way down, and it has nothing to do with, uh, with price or anything else. People are just choosing uh, different um, 
uh, beverages. And the whole time that pop consumption is on its way down, people's waistlines and our health uh, health in our children is getting worse and worse and worse. So if there was a correlation between pop and health, it certainly doesn't bear out in the statistics. And the other part is making people pay more and having this celebrity chef who just bought a 10 million uh, pound house in north of London tell Canadians that they have to pay more taxes at a time um, when their pocketbooks are already being stretched uh, is a little rich. And uh, it doesn't achieve the objectives that it's supposed to. And it also doesn't make uh, Canadians healthier. Yeah, and one interesting thing, I mean, you mentioned the lobster tails and butter, also rich, by the way, but for different reasons. Uh, I looked up uh, when I heard about this just uh, on Google, and and this is, you know, nothing but the hardest hitting of journalistic research. I I put all of like 30 seconds of effort into it. Just Jamie Oliver cake recipes. And the lists that came up were, were endless and endless. Now, I enjoy cake, and I look like the type of person who enjoys cake, and I'm unrepentant about this. But but again, it's this question of hypocrisy. Like, on one hand, you're saying to people, you shouldn't do this, because that's what what saying this should be taxed higher to discourage consumption is saying. It's that you shouldn't do it. Yet he's telling people how to make cakes yeah. in their house. He's serving pop at his restaurants. You know, why let people put sugar in their coffee or in their cappuccinos? I mean, if you want to start entering this territory of, you know, we believe that we know what's better for people better than they do, then why not go the full Monty with it? Well, and that's right. And even last night I was at uh, my local Sobeys and examining some of his food. And while some of it was low in fat and calories, it was also high in sodium and salt. So, the, you know, there's, uh, there's a kind of a demon in every corner here. The other issue is, and you made a great point there, is that, uh, look, he says one thing about these products, yet he serves them. Well, imagine what happens when you start putting a tax on this, because then the person who decides what gets taxed and what doesn't is the government. And in government, there are, thousands, there are hundreds of lobbyists who go out and try to convince government that their product is healthy and theirs is not. A good example of this is apple juice. Apple juice is high in sugar uh, and, as a result, high in calories, um, yet it has a lot of obvious health benefits. And I think most of us, I have young kids, we serve it to them because there's other benefits to it. it should that be part of this tax or not? And on and on we go with trying to decide how to apply these taxes. And really, do we want people like Chef Oliver and even worse, the government, making decisions about what's healthy for our kids and our families uh, and what's not? Or should we make those decisions in our own kitchens for ourselves with the information that is made available to us? I think we are all, uh, Andrew, I like to think Canadians are fairly smart people, and uh, we can decide for ourselves whether or not something's healthy for our family or not. We don't really need government or celebrity chefs to tell us that. One question I would have to ask is whether there has been any success on this anywhere it's been tried. Because I remember uh, New York several years ago had, you know, the war on on salt, and and it it was an abysmal failure. Like, it just did not do anything so much so that the city is, is, I mean, just sort of threw up his hands about it. Yeah, well, another example of that, you know, in this particular case is Denmark. Denmark had a pop tax. It came in uh, um, uh, by one government, and then shortly there was an election fought, and it was repealed. And the reason why it was repealed was for two reasons. The first is the government did a, a study and found that they could find no discernible health impacts as a result of having this tax. The second one was uh, it was extremely difficult to administer. It was costing them uh, millions of euros to try to keep track of what is First of all, the definition of what is sugary drink and what isn't. And second of all, to then go around and collect this with all the small businesses. If small businesses don't have enough paperwork and red tape facing them, well, imagine one more tax that you have to collect, keep track of, and remit to the government, uh, which is exactly what happened uh, in that case. So so there, sure, they tried this, uh, this, and they ended up repealing it after a year, uh, excuse me, after, uh, after one term of government, because they couldn't find the benefits that so many of these proponents uh, were pushing. Joining me on the line is uh, Kevin Lacey, the Atlantic Director for the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Uh, Always a pleasure, Kevin. Really appreciate your time today. Hey, thanks for having me. The one part of this that really baffles me the most, uh, forget about Jamie Oliver for a second. I mean, he mouthed off like celebrities do. I, I don't think it matters that much in the grand scheme of things. But it's how many people are eating this up hook, line, and sinker. You know, I was looking up a Facebook post about this by a media outlet. I can't remember what it was. And they had asked, you know, well, what do you think? And and someone said, well, you know, I never thought of it before. And this was a person who had clearly never heard of the idea before. She's like, oh, you know, I never thought of it before. But, you know, they do it on cigarettes, so it makes sense. 
I'm like, okay, then, then let's talk about the other side of that. Let's talk about why we need to start or stop with the sin taxes in other areas, these so-called sin taxes of, of literally doing nothing other than making revenue off of the backs of people that have less healthy, in quotation mark, preferences compared to others. And it was one of these things where I just had to shake my head in disdain for that idea of, oh, well, you know, we regulate other things. So, yeah, let, let's add more regulation. Even if it worked, I, I don't think that it would be the place of the government to decide what people do and do not eat. You know, every time I've talked on my show or I've written a column or whatever the case may be about healthcare related things, not like hospitals, but health. I mean, public health initiatives, like, for example, government telling people to eat less salt or government telling people to eat less sugar, whatever the case may be. And I say people should have the right to decide whether or not they want to do this and the government shouldn't be penalizing these decisions. You always get a very similar response, which is basically, well, what about health care? What about health care? Heaven forbid there is something that happens that brings you to the hospital and then the state has to pay for it. The state's on the hook. The state has to pay for your bad decisions if you have a heart attack at 46. And my answer to that is, okay, let's privatize health care. I mean, if you really want to play this game by making it about other issues, let's deal with the root problem, privatize health care, and let everyone fend for themselves. But of course, no one wants to have that discussion. No one wants to have that discussion because it's actually all about government control. That's exactly what they're gunning for here. And I look at, as an example, sin taxes, fat taxes, whatever the case may be, and I just shake my head because you know what? Who cares? And if we really want to play the actuarial game here, why don't we make everything that has a remote health risk a problem? Why don't we ban driving. Cars cause a lot of issues. Why don't we ban travel? Why don't we ban, you know, baths? Because you're less likely to drown in the bathtub than you are if you take a shower. I mean, why don't we really just pick the top 50 risks and just ban them outright? If we want to play the game, let's at least play it in a more intellectually honest way by telling people that we want control over your lives. At least have the guts to tell us that's what you're doing. But that isn't what's going to happen. That isn't what's going to ensue here. So I'm all for encouraging public health, by the way. I mean, this is the, the great part. I'm all for telling people and encouraging people and instructing people and educating people. But it needs to be done through private initiatives. It needs to be done even through schools. It ha- can't be done through coercion. And just to play devil's advocate here, I'm sure some people will uh, find this uh, a little bit amusing. Just to play devil's advocate... Why don't we, instead of saying, which is what a lot of the the leftists will say on this, so-and-so has damaged their lungs by smoking, therefore I shouldn't have to pay for their lung cancer treatment, whatever the case may be. I had a smoker tell me once that, you know what, if anything, if anything, they should get better health care. Why? Because they're going to die younger, so they'll cost less in the long run. And most importantly, they've spent most of their lives paying into the system. Not an actual uh, policy proposition, but still some food for thought, I think, when we look at this area. So look, is Jamie Oliver going to gain any traction? I hope not. I mean, people listen to him because he's done such work in the UK on trying to get healthier menu items at British schools, etc. He's taken away all the fun items in the cafeteria. But I've always said, if you want to get people to make healthier choices, you have to make the healthier choices better, not manipulate them into doing it. You can't force people, even by taking advantage of their pocketbook, to care about things that they simply do not care about, that their DNA simply does not afford them the latitude to care about the same way that progressives might want to think that people do. You know, my uh, friend John Gabriel in the U.S., he wrote a great piece for Ricochet this week on weight loss, and he said, you know what, a lot of people are going to make weight loss New Year's resolutions. He said the way he lost weight was by convincing himself that he cared about it more and wanted to be healthy more than He wanted to eat unhealthy foods. And he said it took him a lot of time to get to that way of thinking. 
but he's lost close to 40 pounds now in just a few months and good on him for doing it. And he didn't need the government to make it happen. Government never helps, I can assure you. We have to take a quick break here. When we come back, we will have Mark Stein making his triumphant return to Lawton Online here on the Rebel.media. We will talk about climate change. We will talk about free speech. And we will talk about cat-inspired songs. Now, this is not songs inspired by the musical Cats, but actually by Mark Stein's pet cat, Marvin. So you won't want to miss that surreal interview. And I mean that in the best of words. Coming up in just a couple of moments, you're listening to Lawton Online on the rebel.media. Stay with us. to Lawton Online with your host, Andrew Lawton, exclusively on the rebel.media. Email your thoughts to Andrew at andrewlawton.ca or tweet Andrew using at Andrew Lawton. Well, it's the moment you've been waiting for, at least the moment I've been waiting for. We have a return guest to the show. Now, I try to diversify, try to broaden, try to have lots of different types of voices and people of different backgrounds and whatnot. But you know what? Why mess with perfection? Mark Stein was the very first guest on the very first episode of the Lawton Online podcast, and he is back once again. This time, though, he's not talking about a new book, not talking about the latest brilliant thing he wrote, but rather what he's been singing. Now, this may shock some of you. It doesn't actually surprise me because I have actually heard Mark Stein live and in concert on a number of occasions. In fact, uh, a couple of years ago, I actually I think it was back in 2010, I actually accompanied him well dressed as an imam. So we'll have to talk about that story a little bit later on when he was performing in London, Ontario, my hometown. And I've also uh, been on stage with him when he was in Toronto singing. So he he's not new to this game in any way whatsoever. But he has an album of cat songs. Not songs from the musical Cats, but songs about cats. The song is called Feline Groovy. And Mark Stein joins me on the line now. But before I get to Mark, I have to play for you a little bit of one of the songs on the album here, just so you actually get a sense of what it is that you're going to be hearing if you listen to uh, to uh, to Feline Groovy. This is a song called I Taught I Taught a Putty Tat by Mark Stein, and it's important to note that this is like nothing else you've ever heard. If it sounds familiar, there's a reason for it. I thought I saw a pussy cat a creeping up on me. Hmm. I thought I saw a pussy cat. 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 I thought I saw a pussy cat a creeping up on me. I did. I saw a pussy cat as plain as he could be. He's watching you. That pussy cat is very bad. He sneaks up from behind. I don't think I would like it if I knew what's on his mind. I have a strong suspicion that his plans for me aren't good. I am inclined to think that he would get me if he could. (laughs) I love it. And by the way, as I was playing that for you, I was actually watching the music video, which you can see on steinonline.com, where you can also pick up a copy of Feline Groovy. But to learn a little bit more about the behinds of the behind the scenes of this, we are joined by the great best-selling author Mark Stein author of the book America Alone, author of the book After America, author of the book A Disgrace to the Profession. So many great titles under his belt and now great singles as well. Mark, uh, great to talk to you as always, sir. Thank you very much for your time today. 
Hey, always good to be with you, Andrew. So d- did you actually see a pussycat is the question uh, inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> I did. Well, if you're, if you're sufficiently paranoid and you're prowling around blighted urban environments in the dead of night, uh, then, uh, then you will certainly feel as if you've seen <laughs> shadow of a black cat cross your path <laughs> uh but the uh but it's a, uh, it's uh it, 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 that that's a, that's a, an old Looney Tunes song from uh, which Sylvester and Tweety uh, used to sing when uh, when Sylvester was chasing Tweety in the old Looney Tunes cartoon and I didn't I didn't want to do it in the Looney Tunes style because you can't really improve on that but, uh, but if you're doing an album of cat songs everyone expects to hear I I tore it, I tore a pooty daddy creeping up on me <laughs> and uh, and I didn't want to do it that way and I was just trying a log uh, and retuning the radio, and uh, the police hit from the early 1980s, Every Breath You Take, came on. And I was listening to that guitar thing at the beginning of it. I thought, I thought, this is I Taught I Tore a Putty Tat. Sting, Sting got Every Breath You Take from I Taught I Tore a Putty Tat. That's where, that's where it comes from. So I decided to do uh, I taught I tore a putty tat in the style of Sting, and um, I haven't I haven't heard from Sting yet. But uh, uh, if the cat doesn't get me in the dark alley, it'll be it'll be Sting waiting for me with the tire iron. <laughs> I, I feel like uh, he may even borrow from from you in his next uh, concert tour. We'll we'll see. And, and uh, I want to talk a little bit more about the album with you later on in the program here. But uh, what what have you been up to lately? I mean, you've obviously been been speaking all over the place. Uh, we had you on when uh, the new book was released uh, the undocumented mark stein and, and you're you're still uh, finding yourself embroiled in a battle with the climate alarmists it seems no matter which way you turn yeah well that 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 case uh, i'm being sued by the hockey stick guy and it's actually been a year since uh, it was a year last wednesday since they had oral arguments in some tiny procedural aspect of the case and the judges have yet to rule on that they've had they in that time i've written a book about this guy and his <laughs> hockey stick uh, and they can't take that to these three lazy uh, judges in the district of columbia uh, can't take the time to actually issue an order uh, 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 so that'll that'll run for years and uh, it's 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 interesting it i mean it's it's you ask what i've been doing i've been trying to let it not consume my life i was uh, speaking in copenhagen uh, about six weeks ago, on the tenth anniversary of the Mohammed cartoons uh, in the in the Danish Parliament, uh, because the uh, and the U.S. State Department issued a travel advisory warning U.S. citizens not to go anywhere near my event because it was too dangerous, which <laughs> I was kind of flattered by. And I've now seen that the U.S. State Department has just issued a travel advisory warning warning Americans not to go anywhere on the planet because it's all dangerous. <laughs> so so that's not so flattering because I thought I'd been singled out when they said uh, don't go near that Mark Stein event in Copenhagen. But they're now saying uh, don't go to Copenhagen, don't go to Paris, don't go to Yemen, don't go to Australia, don't go to London, Ontario. The whole planet has gone to hell as far as uh, the State Department's concerned. So it's too dangerous to go anywhere. Well, thank goodness we have the world's leader saving the world from all of its imminent threats in Paris this week, right? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is almost, uh, you know, Obama actually stood up, the so-called leader of the so-called free world, actually stood up and said the most powerful rebuke that we could send to ISIS after they kill, they slaughter uh, over 100 people in, in concerts and soccer stadiums and restaurants, the most powerful rebuke we can send to ISIS is to go ahead and hold the stupid climate conference that they're holding. Uh, you know, because if we, if, if, we, if we don't spend two weeks talking uh, about sea levels in the Maldives in the 22nd century, then the terrorists will have won. ISIS must be laughing their heads off at, at the world's leaders this week. Well, especially, too, and I, I pointed this out on, on the program, I think it was on Friday, uh, when uh, Justin Trudeau, our, our prime minister, announced uh, that he was going to be committing $2.5 billion to fight climate change, not in, in Canada, not in, in the UK, not in China, but to fight climate change in uh, the, the third world and in the developing world. And I couldn't help but think that, you know, maybe the people of, of Sudan and uh, the people of Haiti and the people of, uh, you know, the Central African Republic have a few more priorities than warm weather. 
Yeah, I mean, basically, one way to look at the whole climate change scam is is that it's uh, a form of neo-colonialism. It's ex- it's essentially a way uh, for the rich world to deny the developing world the chance to live as they do, and uh, and 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 to maintain them in poverty. And I think that's a, I think that's a disgusting thing to do. Fortunately, they're not going to go along with it. Um, you know, one of the interesting things about the Copenhagen conference, uh, whatever it was, five or six years ago, was that basically the entire developed world had agreed to hurl it itself off the cliff and destroy the global economy. And it was basically China, India, and Brazil who, at the last minute, grabbed the, uh, the coattails of the insane Western world throwing itself off the cliff and pulled them back. And I'm, I'm, I'm the, the, the only thing that's saving us from a big government uh, climate socialist agenda is the fact that uh, the the developing world knows it's it's nonsense and and uh, won't and won't let us get away with it thank thank god thank god for that i mean but it comes to something when you need the chinese politburo to say to save the planet and it's it's quite quite startling too that that we're hearing such a, a brazen fear mongering about the climate arguments uh, in a city where quite literally there was a, a terrorist attack that that killed over a hundred people in, in the streets just a couple of weeks ago. You have Justin Trudeau who who visits the place where it happened, visits the concert hall, and still says that climate change is the biggest threat facing mankind. We have the the Prime Minister of India, a country that's seen its fair share of terrorism, calling climate change an, an urgent threat. And I, I'm just wondering why there aren't world leaders that are that are stepping up to this nonsense and saying, hey, you know what, we have bigger threats here. Well, you know, for someone like Justin Trudeau or Obama or David Cameron or Francois Hollande or Angela Merkel or any of them, really, uh, to, to address what actually happened in Paris, honestly, is to ask too much of them. And it's easier to it's easier to save the planet. That's what's so pathetic about it. Uh, you know, we're asking people who should be trying to save their towns and their cities and their provinces and their countries, and they're saying, "Oh no, we can't do that." But saving the planet, that we can do. I mean, if you if you look, take uh, Belgium for example, where they we were told that no go zones didn't exist in Europe that it was just something that right wing islamophobes made up the the government of belgium has admitted that molenbeek uh this suburb of uh of brussels uh, a couple of miles from nato headquarters and the governing institutions of the eu is beyond its control now now we're supposed to take yet the belgian prime minister is there at the stupid climate conference uh, cooking up plans to save the planet. This is a guy who can't save one lousy suburb of his own capital city, but he presumes to be able to save the planet. Uh, Barack Obama can't enforce his own southern border. He says it's impossible. He says it's cloud cuckoo land. It would be absurd to expect him to do it, uh, but he presumes to be able to save the planet. Uh, th- I mean, this, this is the classic arrogance of politicians, that it's always far easier uh, to solve to solve problems that don't exist than to actually deal with the ones uh, facing you right now uh, in in the streets of Paris and elsewhere. And even if one does buy into the fact that this is the imminent global threat, none of the leaders seem to uh, want to hold China's feet to the fire on this, who I think if we are going to go down this way of thinking that this is the, you know, this, this massive calamity in waiting, you can't have that conversation without uh, expecting China to do its part, which would be uh, exponentially more significant than any efforts that Canada did or even the United States. Uh, no, I mean, I think it's absolutely ridiculous, the idea of Canada sacrificing itself uh, for the sake of China. China, has, China is a mercantile empire. Um, in, in the space of a, a, a generation, all the old trading routes of Britain's Indian empire, the ports in uh, India and Bangladesh and Sri Lanka, uh, have all been basically now huge new ports have been uh, built by the Chinese in order that they can export stuff westward to us and get oil from the Middle East back to them. Uh, They're not going to give up. They're having made huge investments in that. They're not going to give it up. 
uh, because uh, Barack Obama and Justin Trudeau would like to reduce the global temperature by point oh 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 whatever of a degree uh, by the year 2200. I mean, this, these, these guys sound, you, you know, the Chinese will string along with it uh, at, the, at, the, at the big black tie banquet, but they, the minute the banquet's over, they go back to, to, to business as usual. I know that uh, one of the other uh, little side discussions that's been going on is is uh, Trudeau learning about uh, what you've spoken about in the past, you know, the 19 heads that run the European Union. You, you, you've joked about right. this in the past, and he's met with uh, the EU president, he's met with the head of the European Commission, and, and is there a, a concerning outcome that you think could happen from here when we're already seeing such a, a massive, I think, set of misguided priorities by a lot of these European collectives? Well, I'm, I hope he doesn't get that. Uh, I, n- I notice uh, in that in that way that liberals like to do. He's already begun sort of uh, chippily insulting the Queen uh, in the uh, in the Foreign Ministry of of Canada. But uh, the, the the funny thing about the European Union is, you say he's been meeting all the big shots. It's like President Sagogo, because <laughs> you meet. You meet the president of the European Commission, and then you meet the president of the European Council, and then you meet the president of the Council of Europe, and then you meet the president of the collective presidencies of the presidents <laughs> of the European Union. It's like, it's like the, the joke about banks in small town banks in northern New England was that there was no one uh, below the level of vice president. In the European Union, <laughs> there's no one below the level of president. It's amazing. There's, there's like, there's like uh, 17 guys who've all got president of Europe on their business card. <laughs> so if, uh, if Trudeau uh, ever does uh, decide to turn Canada into a republic, uh, I hope to God he goes for the uh, like bargain basement one president model and not this <laughs> like 17 president European model. Because <laughs> uh, that'll, that'll just uh, 17 presidential palaces with their own limousines will bankrupt the joint. <laughs> Well, but but one of the big problems that comes out of this is that is that we're seeing such a, a centralized form of government take hold in, in Europe now. And I mean, Trudeau has tried to present himself as being the, the global prime minister of Canada. I mean, this is sort of the, the entire air that he and his cabinet have about them, which is more of an interest in saving the planet than saving the country, it seems. Yeah. And, you know, the real the reality, that's actually an important, a very, a very important point, Andrew, because most of us don't live in in the planet. We live in our neighborhood. And, and so this idea of planetary schemes are all very well, but they have to be in, enforced locally. And one of the, you know, Angela Merkel has made plans for, quote, Europe, unquote, to absorb all these millions of so-called refugees. What does that mean? It means in, in one German village of 120 people, uh, they've been ordered to take uh, 750 refugees. So that German village of 120 Germans has ceased to exist. They're now like a, they're now like a minority ethnic German ghetto in a much larger, instantly Islamized village. And and all over, I was, uh, I mentioned I was in Denmark uh, a few weeks ago. I was I was also in uh, Sweden and a couple of other places. And it's interesting when you're in. Malmo, Sweden, uh, that the, the rhetoric of all the governments is all on this Europe-wide, planet-wide, where we're making decisions for the entire planet. And increasingly, the focus of all these people who don't get to go to all the G20 summits and the climate conferences is on uh, how life in their particular neighborhood, their city, their county, their province is getting worse. And, they, and that's what their focus is. And I think this idea that you know, uh, just just Justin Trudeau is supposed to represent the interests of the Canadian nation and the people of Canada, and it's not for him to solve the problems of the Maldives or whatever else tickles his fancy. I wanted to turn to the actual album now, Feline Groovy, because this is something that a lot of people who only know uh, you from uh, listening to you on Rush Limbaugh or seeing you on Hannity w- would strike them as a little bit odd that you actually can have a lighthearted approach to all of the songs of felines. And uh, I've listened to uh, the album now. It's lots of fun. I- I'm not a huge cat lover, but I like a lot of the songs on it. I'm going to play for you a little bit of one of the other tracks on the album as well. And I just love the instrumental on this one. This song is called She Only Talks That Way to the Cat, sung by Mark Stein. I was snoozing 
snoozing on the sofa when she came in from work. She started baby talking and she sure didn't shirk. How's mama's pookie wookie? How's her big sweetie pie? I kinda smiled and I opened one eye. Yeah, mama's gone get lovey doveys had a hot day. I was just about to answer her when I heard her say, You so fat and lazy, but you sweet as can be. That's when I knew she wasn't looking at me. Oh, oh I wish she'd talk to me like that. Didn't care where I scratched or sat. And gave me praise for being lazy and fat. But she only talks that way to the cat. Oh, yeah. She only talks that way to the cat. Well, Mark, a lot of people obviously not aware of this talent of yours, but I know that when the event that I mentioned a few moments ago on the show in London took place, a lot of people saw you on stage, they saw you singing, and I've had a ton of people ask me, you know, when is Mark Stein going to come back to London? Yeah, I had I had a great time uh, with, with you in London a couple of years back. I'd, l- I'd love to come back to that. I'm not sure what uh, venue will agree <laughs> to host me, because if you re- recall... Uh, we had a. Uh, uh, what, they they let they they agreed to host Sexapalooza, but they didn't want to have Steinapalooza. <laughs> there, there was some bondage. The, whatever it was, the municipal venue uh, agreed to have the big bondage event, uh, but they thought that it would be uh, it would be inappropriate and offensive to have me if I if I was hanging upside down in the bondage dungeon with uh, electrodes clamped to my nipples. That's wholesome family entertainment in London, Ontario. But if I want to actually stand up and give a speech, that's far too dangerous, and it has to be banned. So, so I will come back. But we may have we may have problems uh, booking a room. Uh, but I'll uh, I, I did enjoy it last time. Had a great time. Yes, indeed. And that was uh, the the one venue was Lo- Lo- the London Convention Center. So we'll have to to try to that's find right. a, an alternate uh, establishment for you. Uh, but I, I have to ask about the album because when uh, initially I, I heard you were doing this, and I, I think you released Cat Scratch Fever as a as a single, your cover of the Ted Nugent song around the time that uh, uh, the one we played a little while ago, I Taught, I Taught, Putty Tat, uh, came out. Uh, where was the inspiration from this? Because I didn't know you were such a cat lover until I heard uh, these singles. Well, no, I, I, I've, always, I've always loved cats, and some cats you are closer to than others. You know, cats can be pretty standoffish. Some of them are just what we call around here barn cats, and they just want to, uh, you know, they like to steer clear of you and then come into the house once every couple of weeks or whatever. Um, but I, I, got, I acquired a new cat, uh, a stray, uh, last year. He came into my life, and uh, a cat called Marvin, and uh, he just sort of, he's one of these very friendly cats who's always like around your feet. And so he's kind of, when he'd be nuzzling against my feet, I just found myself, I'd start singing uh, little uh, cat songs uh, to him. And after all, and he, he seemed to enjoy it, which doesn't always happen. I mean, I wouldn't recommend trying it with wild animals or whatever, but the... Um, <laughs> But the uh, but uh, he seemed to he seemed to like it and uh, and 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 ha- about halfway through I was like singing uh, everybody wants to be a cat uh, 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 or, or the alley cat song or some the one the other ones on the album and uh, it suddenly it suddenly occurred to me you know there are an awful lot of of uh, good cat songs good dad good dog songs I mean I, I like dogs too but. On the dog song front, uh, there are far fewer good dog songs than cat songs. So I, I put together a short list uh, uh, of my uh, uh, my favourites, and we uh, and 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 we did them, and and we had a uh, a great time with them. And I've I've I I haven't I I've, I've always kept my kind of uh, professional life and my cat life fairly separate. Uh, except for once many years ago when I had a little kitten called Elliot and I just recorded a big special with Andy Williams for Christmas uh, who were, and Andy Williams was like Mr. Christmas in those days and I came back and I found that uh, Elliot had mistaken the tape for a big ball of spring, uh, a string, and it actually unwound and chewed up <laughs> the first two minutes of the Andy Williams Christmas. Oh my! Show, <laughs> which, uh, 
<laughs> which I, which required a lot of uh, artful re- had to reconstruct <laughs> his introduction. He, he'd said, "Hi, everybody. This is Andy Williams. Great to be with Mark Stein for uh, with, uh, with you this Christmas." And I had to find the matching syllables, so it all came out as, <laughs> "Hi, everybody. This is Andy Williams. Great to be with Mark." <laughs> so, so ever since then, I've kept my cat life and my professional life separate. But, uh, but this this new cat in my life uh, uh, was such fun I thought I'd uh, I'd uh, pose with him for an album cover and uh, where to get where together rather bleary on the album cover at about two or three in the morning when we both had a uh, few martinis too many <laughs> and the waiters are uh, getting sick of us and wish we'd leave but now, that's the kind of life we lead now I, I just have a moment left in the segment here Mark but are you concerned that in the era of the Canadian Human Rights Commission that there might be a, a, an issue with you leaving out other uh, marginalized animal groups that are also deserving of albums? Yeah, no, I, I understand that. Uh, but, I, I, you know, my cat has a mischievous sense of humor and uh, would, uh, you know, will will doubtless uh, claim to be a gay cat or a transitioning cat if or a Muslim cat if that comes up. He's, he's got that same kind of uh, uh, slightly malicious sense of humor as me. So I'm confident we can see off the Human Rights Commissions if, uh, if it comes to that. I don't believe, I don't believe even a Canadian Human Rights Commission would rule that if you make a cat album, you also have to make a moose album. I mean, (laughs) I may be underestimating them in the new Trudopia, but I don't believe it'll yet come to that. All right. Well, uh, hopefully hopefully, uh, you'll have the the best in your luck at evading the uh, Human Rights Commission again, and and also best of luck in in the ongoing uh, struggles in the, uh, or stalling struggles, I should say, in the U.S. courts with the the lawsuit against you. The album is Feline Groovy, available at steinonline.com, and you should also check out for uh, all the people on your Christmas list uh, some of the great books there, like, for example, uh, Disgrace to the Profession. Uh, Mark Stein, always a pleasure, sir. Really appreciate your time today. Hey, good good to talk with you, Andrew. Seriously, Christmas item. I already have my copy, in any case. The reviews, I want to hear them if you try the album out. Andrew at andrewlawton.ca is my email address. When we come back in just a couple of moments' time, we will have more of Lawton Online on the rebel.media. I'm Andrew Lawton, folks. Stay tuned. He's unapologetic, unwavering, and unafraid to take on the left sacred cows. He's Andrew Lawton, and you're listening to Lawton Online on the Rebel.media. Welcome back to Lawton Online on the Rebel.media. The first part of my interview with Ezra Levant was actually focused on the climate summit going on in Paris right now. And I think it's a really interesting discussion to have. And I'm glad that we had Mark on this week of all weeks because he's become the guy in the anti-global warming alarmism movement. I mean, he's the guy that has all the facts, has all the figures, and more importantly, isn't afraid to call out BS when he sees it. But there was a great piece I wanted to spotlight in the Globe and Mail uh, this week by Margaret Wente, and she writes about the climate talks, We want to feel good about ourselves. And she's talking about Justin Trudeau having taken Paris by storm. She says that he's showing Canada as having a green image. She's talking about all the work he's doing in the international community to smooth things over because apparently things were just so bad under Prime Minister Stephen Harper. And then she talks about the fact that climate change is a polarized political issue rather than an issue of science. She talks about Michael Hart a trade negotiator who's a Carleton University professor, and she talks about his book where he writes that climate change is politicized and has been distorted. And one quote that she attributes to him is, quote, multiple interests have become dependent on these policies and will fight to maintain them, including thousands of officials whose careers are wedded to them. 
As so often happens in public policy, unintended or harmful harmful consequences become accepted practice despite their cost and annoyance. And she writes about his books on trade policy, but the interesting thing is that his climate book called Hubris, which has uh, the quote that I just uh, expressed to you, he couldn't get a publisher. He writes it as a centrist. He's not critical of climate change as a scientific theory, but he doesn't talk about it in a dogmatic way. Wente writes, quote, it is aimed at the broad agnostic middle people who care about the issue but aren't certain that we're doomed if we don't take drastic action now. In other words, it's a great antidote to Naomi Klein. And he writes on this that governments are playing a game. They're seeing it as a political issue rather than a real issue. And there's someone I know, and I think he's been on The Rebel before. I haven't had him on this show. He's actually a math professor at Western University in London. Dr. Christopher Essex has written books on climate, and he won't do debates. And I've said this to him. Why won't you do debates, Chris? I mean, I know him reasonably well. And he said, because no one in climate debates will debate science. He said the media aren't equipped to moderate science, and he said the people talking about global warming aren't prepared to talk about science. They're only prepared to talk about politics. So he's had to say, look, I'll do interviews, but we need to actually talk about real science in them. And he said he'll even supply materials to journalists. And in a lot of cases, they'll look at it and be like, "Eh, yeah, this isn't really what we're looking for, because they want someone to talk about politicians. They want someone to talk about the failings of government or the failings of humanity, not to talk about the actual science, which is that there's no global warming. Antarctica is getting bigger. And and Chris Essex, Essex is even a renegade in the climate change skeptics community because he won't even see that you can accurately measure a global temperature. And he's actually written about that in the past. So I think there's a lot of valid objection here, but we need to all be playing by the same playbook. And that simply isn't happening with the climate nonsense we're seeing in Paris right now. It's about everyone feeling good, everyone patting each other on the back. And they all flew countless people and countless thousands of miles to get there, all for the purposes of saving the planet. We've got to take a quick break here. When we come back, we'll have a final wrap up of Lawton Online here on the Rebel.media. Stay tuned. It's time for It Must Be a Liberal, only on Lawton Online. Scouring every corner of the globe for stories so outrageous, there must be a liberal involved. Well, you heard the man. It is time for It Must Be a Liberal, scouring every corner of the globe from where haven't we done in a while? From Peterborough to Palau, from the Philippines to Panama, finding the story so outrageous, there must be a liberal involved. And today we actually go no further than Windsor, Ontario, where a 27-year-old man has pleaded guilty in a Michigan court after allegedly, well, it's not allegedly anymore, he's pleaded guilty, after smuggling 51 live turtles across the border in his pants. He was found at the Detroit Windsor Tunnel with 41 live turtles taped to his legs and 10 hidden between his legs. The day of his arrest, he had actually packed more than 1,000 turtles into suitcases that he sent with a runner with the intent of flying them to Shanghai from Detroit. Now, each of the six counts that he has been arrested on carries a sentence of up to 10 years in prison. Even though he's from Windsor, this is all playing out in the U.S. courts. The... It must be a liberal, though, is not Kai Zhu, 27, who found a great way to make a couple extra bucks. It is the judge in Michigan who thinks that he needs more punishment after probably being bitten in the junk by 51 turtles. That seems to be punishment enough. So the judge in that case, clearly a liberal. In any case, we have to wrap things up, folks. When we come back next week, we will have lots more of Lawton Online on the rebel.media. My name's Andrew Lawton. Thank you, God bless, and we'll talk to you next week, Canada. Thanks for tuning in to Lawton Online. Check out the rebel.media for lots more fearless content and commentary.